Um, so welcome to Castle NYC's uh, Actors Discuss Project. Is uh, Actors Discuss Project? Is uh, Actors Discuss Project? Is, uh, Actors Discuss Project. Really, we're not called Actors Discuss. <laughs> I don't know why I said what. I said it, and I'm like, that's not what we call it. <laughs> I was like, did I miss that in the meeting where we renamed it? It missed a lot of words. Actors discuss projects at home. Quarantine <laughs> edition. I Thank you for joining us. <laughs> for that. Day two. Welcome to Casper NYC's Actors Perspective. Uh, tonight we're going to be discussing Dinner by Moira Buffini. So of course, uh, as we always do, first start with the question is, what are y'all's initial thoughts on the play? I um, I did enjoy this one. Um, crazy dinner. It definitely got dark. And then I was like, oh, I don't think I was really ready for the ending. Um, love um, when... I just love those characters that just don't help the situation and just make things funny and just say crazy stuff that just don't help uh, help anything. As an actor, I would definitely, I would, I would love to take a crack at it. I think this was pretty uh, cool. I think it, reading it, I could see it's, it'll, it needs to be off the page, at least for me. You know, I, you need to put it on its feet and, and do it and find moments with it. Uh, but it would be a cool challenge to do. Yeah, I've got, I definitely got like a, a couple of thoughts. Like as an actor, I, I share Andre's sentiment of like trying to take a crack at it. Um, I think, I think some of the characters are like interesting. I think one thing that I think maybe uh, I'm not the biggest fan of um, from, from I think both an audience member and, and even an actor perspective is like, everybody f seems to kind of show their cards um, pretty immediately. I think like Paige, Paige who is by far the most interesting character is kind of the same throughout the whole time is like very conniving and cunning and just like kind of cuts at you like right at the shin, like right and at your insecurities. And I feel like that was never hidden um, to the point where I think the ending uh, was, I was like, okay, cool. Um, but I think some, somebody like Lars, I feel like doesn't really change. Like Hal feels like doesn't, doesn't really change. Like this feels like a play we read earlier, but way, way more like safe, I guess. Like where I think I'm forgetting the play, but in that play, at least like you've got so many arcs, you've got these character developments and here it's like, it's kind of flat and I think that's because there is much more shock and spectacle all kind of driven by Paige, like the lobster part and the waste part. Like that, I think that is what makes it more interesting more than the actual characters themselves. Yeah, I think that's a good take on it. Um, I definitely did enjoy this play and you're right in that seeing it on its feet is super important. I feel like any play that kind of has a dinner uh, setting as its focal point, you need to see it because you have to know where these characters are, how they're reacting, when the food's coming out, things like that. Um, <clears throat> to your point, Josue, how do we think this compares to other like dinner and conflict plays that we've seen that kind of take place in one location, thinking about like God of Carnage or rumors that we read earlier? I know, I know Amanda wanted to say something earlier. Um, well, I can try to relate it to that point. I think it, it's interesting because um, in this play, Paige in particular, but all the characters are really direct and like they're saying exactly what's on their mind. It's almost as if we're hearing the subtext that would be a different play's lines, you know, like a different play, like Rumors or something um, or God of Carnage would have these lines and there would be this 
language as the subtext behind those lines of what they're trying to say um meanwhile they're just like oh you're a fucking bitch and like you know it's just a casual tuesday evening or whatever day it is that they're having dinner and i think that's kind of interesting versus like something like betrayal is all subtext like none of the lines have any of that and the actors have to bring that to Mm -hmm. it like this is that kind of opposite um and it's interesting in comparison to uh rumors how they're trying to save face and protect the person like that's you know may or may not have hurt themselves or been shot or whatever um and uh in this they're just she, like it's just everything's all out <laughs> like all out in the open there's no saving face they're like oh yeah we're rich yep mm-hmm. want to hey. kill a lobster what's up <laughs> like it's uh, yeah Shio and then amanda hey i think you had, i think i saw your hand up no, I, I, th- I was just going to say God of Carnage when my um, host was ta- uh, thinking of a play. Yeah. I was gonna be so I'm good. Uh, Shia, go ahead. Uh, yeah, so I was going to say kind of similar to what Amanda said. And, and it was the same thing. I thought of God of Carnage. You have like that one setting and everyone's together under the pretense of, you know, whether we're having dinner or get together. Um, like in this play, you know, we're here for, you know, um, Lars's book being published or whatever have you. Obviously we realize at the end, it's kind of like a, a, a facade, but like at the very beginning, everyone has this very, um, this layer of uh, this, the etiquette of we're at someone's home and we're at a dinner party. And yeah, I totally loved your book and I read it and it was so good no one liked this freaking book, you know? And <laughs> similar to God of Carnage is the alcohol, you know, the more alcohol is coming in, the more brazen these characters are becoming and the more they're just like, fuck it, we're just gonna kill a lobster on this table, fuck it. I really thought you're, you know, I really think your ideologies are BS and your psyche mind or whatever it is you wrote about. Like the more the alcohol <laughs> is, flow and the more it's just like I don't think they were there were a lot of false pretenses at the very beginning of this but I think it was pretty clear that we got a group of you know rich assholes but um it was it's kind of similar in that in that sense we're just like we're, we're polite we're society people we're having etiquette and then the booze is flowing and things kind of start on reveling you know yeah I think it's almost like a like a Real Housewives or something, the more they drink, the like nastier and more drama there is. So good. It's like a train wreck that you just like can't stop watching. Mm-hmm. <laughs> um, so kind of bouncing off Shia's point here, she does bring up Lars's book, which was definitely on the self-help range of like taking control of your destiny and and knowing what affects you. So how does that impact his relationship with the other characters through it? Like for me. I think about Lars's relationship with Hal and Hal says, you know, your book sitting on the bestseller shelf and my book is growing mold in the, the geek category. Mm-hmm. You know, it was a great example. So what about some of the other characters? Uh, Amanda, hey. Uh, well, I, um, I found it uh, interesting how it was, it could, it could be interpreted as like a commentary on these people that write uh, self-help books or, you know, this, this archetype that Lars is, is actually uh, not like super intuitive about the people that he's in relationship with in the play and how, uh, you know, he's, he's making all of these kind of like sharp and fast judgments on people and, um, like thinks he really like knows what's going on uh but clearly like his wife is plotting a uh you know a, an elaborate plan to like kill herself in a glorious way and uh if he like couldn't be more unaware you know um so i i i find that like i, I kind of humorous uh, when there's a character that like is glorified as very knowledgeable and is like so very obviously like missing a lot of things. 
No, I think that's true, especially because he does, like you said, he seems like he tries to have such a good knowledge of of other people and what's going to impact them. And there's then, a whole, oh, sorry, go ahead. No, to miss the easy sights. Yeah, and, uh, like that whole part where he, like, he's like, well, Paige is, you know, already declining. Like he's saying it to Hal, I think. He's like, she's, you know, she's the typical consumer. And, yeah, I think that's good. Uh, Shia. I was gonna say that I found it really interesting that Lars wrote a book about like, kind of like manifesting destiny kind of thing. Like whatever you want, you can see it, you can have it, go after it kind of thing. But he very clearly does not live by the words he's written. He's obviously having an affair with, what's her name, Win. Win. Mm-hmm. Win. Um, he obviously does not want to be in a relationship, in his marriage with Paige, you know, he clearly has this like it's very obvious that he cares about Wynn and her feelings and anytime like she spoke up it's like oh that's cute like you know and anytime he spoke to Paige it was obviously it was condescending and he's just sick and tired of her and you see that unravel more and more as the play goes on and the alcohol flows but it's like it's really interesting that you wrote a whole self-help book about going after what you really want and being brave and you know your fantasies make them reality and yet he's living this lie so it's just mm-hmm. he's kind of being a hypocrite <laughs> a little bit definitely uh amanda m um i wanted to talk about win a little uh i think it's interesting because like we all just said he writes these self-help books but she like eats it up and worships him like as if he is the god that the mag is the hairdresser magazine says that he is and i think there's that appeal and form of flattery that she's like eating it up like to the point where he has a knife at her at his neck and she's like just will that it won't stab you or like whatever the line is that she says like what kind of batty nonsense is that that like you can will not to be st- like to not have your throat slit like the knife just won't go through because mind over matter like that's a whack but she like eats it up and believes every little bit that he says and she's like well that book really helped me well that book really helped me it's almost like um like a super celebrity like for topical that's not shit creek um i watched the the britney documentary and there was a lot of the um a lot of the fans were like, I just want to help her like she helped me. And like how we look to these artists and celebrities and hold them to such praise because, you know, they represent hope or something good and positive. So Wynn does that to Lars because she idolizes him and thinks he's this amazing thing. And he's like, yes, thank you, feed my ego. Yeah, I think he's like keeping it real. (laughs) I think the line is something like deflect the wound. Yeah. (laughs) <laughs> uh andre go ahead i almost felt like he was in a room full of critics like or like everyone is is represents a person who would read one of these books you got some people who will really fall in love with it and like eat it up and take it literal and then you got the best people who are close to you and maybe in the same profession and they're kind of jealous of you uh, in a way, especially if they're like, you know, the the work that you are writing is bullshit, especially with Hal and Lars, Hal knows he isn't doing what he says in the book. You know, you're not, you're unhappy, as as Shio said, and yet you're writing a self-help book, why my shit is, is covered in dust. And also Paige knows he's, you know, is on his bullshit because you're ready to divorce me and you're unhappy and I'm nothing. Uh, and I'm sure I was trying to figure out like, did she read it? And did she feel some type of way? Cause sometimes when you are with that person that writes a, some sort of work like that, you're like, this isn't you. And are you talking about me in this book a little bit? Um, and, and I was thinking, did he have a revelation after reading his own bullshit and was like you know what i'm not happy and i'm gonna divorce Paige, and i'm gonna kiss when as soon as she gets here um so i, I don't know i just felt like everybody was a, his critic and he, he knows yeah. even mike even mike saw through his bs and he had to read the book he, he was like the public opinion 
<laughs> right, right. Like you see the cover and you're like, nah, this is bullshit. I think Andre, you have a really good point that like it definitely is a world of the different readers that you would get with his book. You have someone like Wynn who hundred percent believes it to the point when he'll like Paige says something to her and she takes it personal and he goes, Oh no, that's a you know, she's saying something negative to you and Wynn's reaction is, Oh, deflected. <laughs> like definitely a reaction to it, or Lars who is like, oh yes, I love the book, it's great. And his wife is like, nah, he hated it, it freaked him out. Yeah, and I don't think, yeah, right? I don't think he even liked his own, his own work. Well, it says something about Lars's relationships in the past when he reads this well, book, like, oh, you can manifest these things and you can want these things, but my, my wife, Mags, you know, is going through this stuff that would clearly be not in relation to this book like it wouldn't be a positive side to it right yeah um so let's actually dive into uh mike and his appearance in the play like so how does moira deal with the conflict of the class difference between the invited guests like lars and sean and win versus the uninvited like mike i would say it's interesting to see how he's at first not welcome by page and then immediately flips to being more than welcome and not being able to leave at all uh, mm -hmm. multiple times throughout the play where he tries to leave. And what prompts that is, you know, that it would displease Lars if he stayed finally. <laughs> so then she's like, no, now he is staying. Like, just for the fight. <laughs> uh, Shio and then Josue? Um, and Amanda, sorry, sorry. I think it was interesting how, well, one, a couple of things that the first being the description that was given of him was literally a man wearing nondescript clothing like he was he's nothing special he's off the streets we don't know who he is um so i thought it was really interesting that the, even in the description the writer was just like we already are setting a precedence about this man that we don't know anything about and then the second is obviously like he's crashing a party. So, you know, Paige is like, I don't want him here, but it's not even because you're crashing a party. It's because you're obviously someone who's not in our, you know, you know, echelon yeah. of class. And clearly you're here to rob us. So, you know, she's immediately attacking this man who literally is saying, hi, my name is Mike. My van broke down. Can I use your phone to call for help? And she's like, no, you're here to rob us. Look at you, you know, like. You're gonna ruin my murder. <laughs> exactly. It will, bigger picture. But, you know, immediately, like, this is how we're treating people who are asking for help just because they don't look like us or dress like us or seem to have money like us. You know, this man is not asking for handouts. He's not asking, you know, to give him money or give him a car. He's like, I just need to use a phone so I can get up out of here and, you know, figure things out. And it's like a, an immediate, like, accosting. Like, they're just like, she, Paige, is like, no, you're, you're interrupting, you're rude, and you're going to steal from my house, you know? And it's just like this whole, like, breakdown of a person, and you don't know the man, you know? Yeah, I'm kind of curious, just from, again, just thinking of, like, characters and motivations, like, I don't understand why Paige cared at first. Like, given what her plan was, given the fact that she obviously didn't care about her stuff and, like, it invited Mike to steal later, it, it just seemed off to me that she would immediately... That, that that her reaction was to immediately try and get him out because of her concern about robbery. Um, I don't know. I, 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 what, what does everybody else make of that? Because I feel like that that just seemed, that seemed to be like the most normal thing about Paige where she is quite not normal the entire play. Uh, Amanda, and then we'll go to Andre and we'll kind of circle back around. I think it's funny too how um, Mike like takes the stereotype and runs with it. Like he totally fucks with them. He's like, he's like, yeah, no, I, I'm a professional robber. Like I, yeah, I mean, I just robbed your neighbor. You, you, this street's great, you know? Um, and uh, in, in a way I kind of feel like, you know, all these characters, 
are all kind of farcical in their own way. And then Mike is the one that in my experience when I read it was like, oh, this is the character that the audience is like, oh, this, he's one of us. They're like, oh, he's, I'm seeing this through his lens. Um, mm -hmm. And, um, but in relation to what Josue was just saying, um, I, I feel like, uh, <laughs> I to me I just felt like that was a uh, like the very combatant husband and wife like so like because um uh oh my gosh what is the uh Luke no not Luke what's the Lars. name Lars Lars because Lars was like oh of course we can help you um you know Paige automatically you know it was like I was like Lars, this is a dinner, like, what are you thinking, da, 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 you know, and I, I, I feel like it, they strike me as the type of couple where, like, if no matter what the topic is, if one says sky, the other one says ground, you know, and uh, that, that's just my take on, on that. Mm -hmm. No, I think that's a good take. I think you're right in that, um, and kind of how it tackles that of, it is born primarily of the contention between those two and Lars probably trying to put himself in a better light as a person to be like as welcoming as he is. Oh yeah, uh, I love when Paige is like, she's like, this is the most hospitable thing he's done. And what was it? He's in shock. This is the most humane thing he's done in all these years. Yeah. Uh, Andre, go ahead. Uh, as far as dealing with the class thing, I think like Amanda said, making up this whole story and then all of a sudden all these people are like yeah I want to be you know criminals and, and thieves too um and it made me look at like I feel like often you see that when we see stories of rich people meeting some type of I don't know not down and out but or if they're meeting criminals or they're they're, they're meeting, I don't know, people who've, who are self-made or um, people lower than them. They always say, you know, I, I wish I had your strength or your tenacity or wish I could, you know, mm -hmm. have what you had or do what you do. I think I'd be good at that. Um, and then I, I thought, to answer Josue's question, I thought she, I thought Paige got upset because she has a plan in her head and someone coming in interrupts her plan. Also, it doesn't seem like she, she gets pretty upset when someone ruins her plan. Like Bob not being there, not knowing, uh, really pissed her off. Um, and I thought that interruption was just, I, I thought her, her response to that interruption was, uh, in her character. It was for her. It's what she would do. Yeah, definitely. I think you're right. And I think part of it too is with the when the character of Bob, who we don't see at all, like it's such a um diametrically opposed opposite of like the politician who's cheating on his wife, who is or his girlfriend who is not showing up to this party, versus the kind of every man who wanders in and is like yeah, I lied to you guys, but here's the truth about what I see sitting around this table. And he's really the only one who acknowledges uh, uh, Sean, Cyan, we've never said her name the same way twice, I think. Um, but like for what she actually does as a news person. Right. Keep Amanda, up, yeah. your hand pop up. Oh, um, I was going to say that in terms of uh, agree, agreeing with Andre and um, that she has a plan. I wonder if at first she accepts Mike into, or she doesn't want Mike in the home because that's another person that disrupts her whole plan for the evening. Um, but then maybe she thinks it over and recalibrates and is like, okay, well, there's, if it's such a nice house that you're assuming they probably have like cameras everywhere. And so then that's a witness if she lets him go like who was there, who was in the house. Cause like in my first reading of the play, I wondered at the end, like she had been plotting to kill Lars and get him murdered. What was she going to do with the rest of the people? Certainly not let them go as witnesses. 
and then it obviously flips where you know uh Lars does not die and so I wonder if that was the intent or obviously she had thought Lars was going to get murdered so then she's just kind of like if the plan was to murder Lars and then everybody else with poison or whatever who is to say she didn't poison the food for the other guests um to take care of later that if when he shows up she's like no you can't be here and then she's like oh well they're gonna trace him back anyway now I have a witness of who was here and what all was going on and then she's like oh good he could just eat too and then I'll poison him like she's like nope now you can't leave because now I have to kill you too this dinner for her was not about her husband's book being published and the success and all that this is her death dinner and she's angry because her husband doesn't love her he's cheating on her he's gonna divorce her and all this stuff she's bringing all the people all the chess pieces together for a reason you know this is my goodbye and fuck everybody you know i'm gonna you know leave with a bang kind of thing i'm revealing everyone's truths and i'm destroying everybody's lives and i'm taking you all down with me kind of thing so i think it was an important dinner for her i don't think it's like she didn't care about herself or anything like that i think it was really important to her and mike coming into the picture is obviously not planned but i think mike was the refreshing set of eyes that was revealing the truth about everybody which is kind of what her intent was um, i wonder and um, when you guys all read it Am I the only one that initially thought that the waiter changed the plan? <laughs> like, or did, like, did everyone else read it thinking Paige's original intention was a very fanciful suicide? Or, because I thought maybe, like, the waiter, I don't know, is some kind of weird, weird hitman that's like, I'm going to take down the bad guy, and the bad guy is whoever's hiring me for murder. <laughs> like, you know, and flips it around. That's kind of what I thought the first reading of it. Um, so I'm just curious, was I the only one that thought that? Or Well, that actually is the next question of, do we think was Paige's... Um, do you think this night went as Paige planned to? And outside of, obviously, Mike popping in, um, so she had to kind of go off what you're saying, like, yeah, I do, I do think this went as planned it to, when you read through it, now that we know the ending, going back through the play and seeing things like, uh, murder weapons as one of the truths, and it's Paige who answers, you know what will be the best one? Is yeah. And of course, that's what happens, but, um, Shio and Josue, S.I.L.'s hands up. But that's murder weapon, not suicide weapon. But I think she so, would, Well, I don't know. But I don't know what the murder weapon was. That, that's a good question. But I definitely, the first time I read it through, definitely thought the waiter or, you know, the guy that she hired... Because she, okay, I thought at first that he was some kind of, like... Um, I want to say a witness or like detective or something. And it was pretty obvious that Lars is having a, an affair with wind. And then you start hearing that, oh, um, Paige comes for money. She had trust funds. So I was like, okay, maybe there's something in there like, you know, divorce thing. They like, get divorced and he cheated on her. Then she gets all the money, you know? And so I'm thinking like, this was just like a legal guy pretending to be, you know, and then it was like the whole thing with like, she just kept asking for drinks and drinks and drinks. And I was like, oh, she poisoned the alcohol. Like, I just kept trying to figure out what was going It was very clear that this guy was not just a waiter. So as we were reading along, I was like, oh, she poisoned the booze and everyone's done. Like, everyone's going to die, you know? And then in the end, it winds up that, like, she hired him to stab her husband and then kill her. And I was just like, yeah, I get it. As, you, you, as, as Ethan was saying, like, you start reading some of the things that she kind of says on the sly. You know, it's clear that she's heartbroken. It's clear that she feels like she has nothing going on in her life and she's basically has done nothing in life and she's just a stress fund baby and now she has a husband who doesn't love her and is cheating on her and wants to divorce her. So she's just like, whatever. And she seems like this kind of, not just like she's just an asshole character, but she's kind of like a big energy kind of character. You know, it's kind of like one of those people that like there's a lot of buzz around all the time. So I feel like this seemed like the way she would go, you know, like very dramatic with flair and all eyes on me. <laughs> mm -hmm. 
Uh, Hosea. She's also so petty. Like everything she says is all petty all the time, and like that's definitely in line of like watch me die, and sit with that, or like deal with that. <laughs> Very uh, thirteen reasons why. Yeah, yeah, I haven't seen it, but I know about it. Yeah, um, and I think that like that's what I mean. Where it's like there's like when I was talking about the lack of like character development, I felt like there were no surprises and nobody was surprised because very early on, I noted that um, when, she, when Lars was asking about the waiter and she was like, Oh, he's like a different kind of man. He like something about integrity, something about like he, you know, his price is more than just money kind of thing. And that like immediately tells you like, okay, so either like, he's in love, like they're in love together or something or something. Um, then I think later with uh, Lars and Wynn, like just kissing immediately. And then as soon as they meet and when it's kind of revealed that, you know, Lars still loves her when, when Paige gives the envelope to Lars about uh, Wynn, um, it's like, okay, so you knew that too. And you knew that Lars was going to divorce you because she knew about the divorce papers. Um, so I think it was just like her very much saying like, hey, I am the architect, like the total architect here. I know everything, like you can't surprise me. And I know like, you know, how to needle into all your insecurities. Um, and yeah, this is like my ultimate mic drop basically.